Hi guys, it's DC the Blacksmith back for another in-ray vlog. It's been a long time. Um, as you guys can see, if you're watching on YouTube or Twitch or anything like that, trying to do something a little different with the visual effects, you know, it's a grind, but we're getting there. So today I'm coming to you guys with a recap and review and commentary, of course, of the January 6th public hearings. Um, so I have day one and day two of the public hearings. Day one of the public hearings was a primetime event on June 10th at night. And then day two was a Monday morning event and I'll put the timestamps in to separate my commentary. Um, these hearings weren't uh, very long. And as I give the commentary, I'm, I'll touch base on why I think that was, uh, when I say they weren't long, they weren't long like a typical committee hearing that lasts for, you know, a whole day is devoted to the committee hearing. Anyways, let me go ahead and get into day one. So day one, primetime event um, at night aimed at being a very production type event. We heard that the committee, January 6th committee, had hired um, uh, a production team to help them present the material. And as we get into the commentary, I'll, I'll explain how they used a lot of vid video footage and you can tell that it was production quality by the seamless way that the video footage was introduced into the record and how the committee member who was presenting at the time spoke, introduced a piece of footage, continued speaking to hone in the point. Um, there was a lot of criticism about that. I'm not sure why. I feel as though, and I've said before, if you guys if the few of you who watch, if you guys have watched my other videos before, um, you've heard me say that I think a lot of uh, showmanship goes on, particularly in the Senate when they have a televised event. Um, a lot of showmanship went on during uh, the Kentonji Brown Jackson's uh, confirmation hearing. And if they can do that level of showmanship as individuals on the Senate floor or any other floor, then I don't see why this committee couldn't produce something that was captivating for the American people. So there's that. So day one, primetime event at night, the chair of the committee, uh, Benny Thompson, he's a Democrat from Mississippi, I believe. And if that's not correct, I'll um, you know put it in the description box or something like that to correct myself. I'm pretty sure he's a Democrat from Mississippi. Uh, he gave his opening remarks. Um, one of the things that stood out to me from his opening remarks was that he says that we take an oath not to, you know, individuals, we take an oath to protect the Constitution from enemies, both foreign and domestic, um, because what happened on January 6th was a domestic threat. <laughs> it was still a threat, whether the threat comes from foreign or homegrown. It was a threat to the democratic process that was going on at the time. I don't know how else we're going to look at it. Um, so Benny Thompson starts, he sets the tone with how this, uh, public hearing. And if you could see me, I have hearing in quotation marks because uh, it wasn't a traditional hearing where everybody gets to question the witnesses, but he shows some clips of uh, the testimony, uh, closed doors testimony of Bill Barr. Um, and one of the things Bill Barr said was he made it very clear that he wasn't okay with it. Uh, he reminded everybody about how the committee started. And for everybody who says that this is a you know, partisan committee, this, that, and the third, you know, people don't like to start from the beginning of things. I find a lot of times that memories are short. 
and people want to look at the result and the conclusion and the rebuttal of something, but they don't want to go back through the history of how we got here. First of all, uh, Adam Kinzinger and Liz Cheney are two Republicans on the committee. Liz Cheney happens to be the vice chair of the committee. I don't care what anyone says. Liz Cheney is no less a Republican. I'd maybe say she's even a little bit more uh, conservative rather than closer to Republican senator. You're not going to get me to believe that Liz Cheney, Cheney is anything other than a Republican. Um, but anyways, how the committee got to the point that it is in today is after January 6th, a horrific event, an event that was very um, violent and loud and uh, embarrassing to our nation, the Democrat controlled House voted to establish a commission to investigate multiple things that went on that day. One of the primary things, um, two, two of the primary things that uh, they wanted to investigate was the intelligence failure, the fact that um, the Capitol Police were overwhelmed on the on start as if no one, as if the Capitol wasn't properly staffed by way of security to handle that event. No one anticipated there being any issues. And even if no one anticipated there being any issues, whenever there's a large event near the Capitol, security is always you know, stepped up as it, in my opinion, as it should be, duh. So why wasn't it that day? It seemed like they just were caught completely off guard. And I don't know how. Um, I've told you guys that I'm a Republican. I got all the emails that day. Oh, come to this, come to that, come to that. And if I got the email, little old me with a YouTube channel with no subscriber, then I know that email went out to everybody. And yeah, I know there was a lot of people that were going to be there. So I don't know why there was a lack of preparation for anybody. Um, so, uh, and no, I was not planning on a, attending that foolishness. Absolutely not. So the, secu the lack of security staffing was one of the concerns. And then the other concern was the... Uh, I'm going to phrase this in a way, the lack of response as well as the complicit nature of the event, it seemed as, as though there was a lack of responding to what was going on in junction with the fact that a certain individual may have wanted it to go on. And that individual was the Donald Trump, the president. So we know that there was an impeachment trial about this issue. And then after, and I'm pretty sure I have my timeline right, after the impeachment trial um, and he wasn't convicted, the Democratic controlled House voted for a commission. And the idea of the commission was supposed to be a 9-11 style commission that was, you know, Republican, Democrat, Republican, Democrat, Republican, Democrat, and just to investigate everything cohesively. So the House control, uh, the Democratic control House put together this committee, they sent to the Senate. I'm going to let y'all guess which senators did not vote to acquiesce to this bicameral, you know, bipartisan thing. The 9-11 the commission involved members from both houses. That's what makes it uh, bicameral. I don't think I'm saying that word right, but that's not the point. The point is that the 9-11 commission involved members from both the Senate and the House. And it also involved, uh, I want to say equal Republican, Democrat, Republican, Democrat. So it also made it bipartisan. So the, the proposal that came out of the House was to establish in the same way a January 6th committee that was included both members of the House and the Senate and bipartisan. The House and the Senate have to vote on that for it to go through. So it gets to the Senate and I'm gonna let y'all figure out which senators of what party decided not to vote for it. So they didn't vote for it. I don't know if they thought that it was just gonna go away. 
they they thought that you know the house was just going oh okay well they didn't vote for it we're gonna go sit down that's not how it works the house as a body is allowed to take up whatever committee they want to as long as you know the house votes for it in majority just so happens that this is a democrat controlled house so they voted to have the committee when they voted to have the committee they then asked um Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger to be a part of it and then I think Kevin McCarthy, at this point, after they rejected the bipartisan proposal, after they rejected the bicameral proposal, then he went on whining about how they didn't want the people that he picked to be on it. But my man, <laughs> you could have had whoever you wanted on it had everybody supported what was supposed to be a bipartisan commission. But I'm already getting a little too far in the weeds. I just want to remind everybody about how we got here. And in um, uh, Congressman uh, Benny Thompson's opening remarks, he reminded everybody how we got here too. So this first day was mainly talking points between Benny Thompson and Liz Cheney. So Benny Thompson gave his opening and then he said, and I would like to uh, hand it off to my vice chair um, for her to also give her opening remarks. So um, she spoke. She also kind of repeated some of the same things about taking an oath against enemies, both foreign and domestic. She talked about how this is going to be a multi-focus effort. So the public hearings are going to focus on a series of events um, in a way that uh, tells a complete story. So the first, I think, um, and I, I kind of got a little bit confused, uh, but basically they're going to go through what led up to January 6th and then January 6th. You know, it's going to start with what's being called the big lie that the election was stolen and then riling up people. And then we get to January 6th and what happened to that day. And then we're in the middle of January 6th and what was what was being done on that end um, is the best way I can explain it. She explained it way better than I can. But basically, this is going to be a multiple hearings. Each hearing is going to have a little bit of a different focus. She shows footage from um, a few of Donald Trump's advisors. She shows footage from General Milley. Um, she shows footage from video testimonies from Ivanka Trump. So, and you, I don't know if you guys keep up with this stuff like I do, but uh, since this committee has been established, we always hear about, oh, this person met with the committee, this person met with the committee, this person met with the committee, and we ain't seen none, <laughs> but they met with the committee. So as we're seeing these video testimonies, these are the people, this is what was going on that we didn't see when they were leaking out. And I say leaking out because it was kind of irritating maybe for me, but it was a little bit irritating when we kept getting all these, oh, this person met with the January 6th committee. Okay, but what did they say though? Okay, they met with them. Cool. What did they say? What came out of it? Well, now, you know, a day, a day late and dollar short, but, but, but won't he do it? But now we get to know what was said. So all of the testimony had a common theme that all these people knew that Donald Trump lost the election and that there was nothing wrong with the election and multiple people told him. Uh, one thing that Liz Cheney mentions is that, um, <laughs> and <laughs> this was shade, she mentions that, oh, Donald Trump, you know, didn't listen to the people that were giving him sound advice. He wanted to listen to, and this is what she said, this is what she said. This is not me. An inebriated Rudy Giuliani. That's what Liz Cheney said, not what I said. I'm just re repeating what she said. Um, and uh, I just took a note to say that what Bob, oh, let me keep going and I'll come back to that. So after she speaks and she shows uh, different types of um, different people's testimony saying that they told him he didn't win. They knew he didn't win. They knew there was... Um, 
they he needed to accept the results. Then she bounces back to uh, um, the chair and they show very graphic unseen footage about the violence that was going on as the, um, I don't know what the politically correct way to call these people, these lawless um, vagrants. I don't know. I don't know what we're supposed to call them, but I, I think insurrectionists is a proper word, but the violence that the insurrectionists were, you know, beating the capital security, uh, trampling over each other, um, the things they were saying to the police officers, that type of stuff. So he, Benny, um, Benny Thompson, he leaves us with that footage and then they go into a 10 minute recess. When they come back, they have what is called the witness testimony segment. This was not the traditional witness testimony where you have a panel and you know you have questions back and forth. This was more of a production style. These people gave brief statements and then the chair and vice chair introduced more video footage to further, uh, to further uh, demonstrate the statement that each witness was saying. So uh, there was a female um, officer and she was one of the first officers injured that day. There was um, a guy who was working on a documentary um, who ended up filming, who ended up capturing a lot of the footage from the point of view of the insurrectionists. And then there was somebody else, I may not have wrote them down, but um, they talked about what they saw and experienced that day and it was disheartening. Uh, basically, there was a lot of Oath Keepers and Proud Boys there, and it sounded like it was a joint operation, and it sounded like it was planned ahead of time. So mm, that's what they were doing. So uh, at the beginning, I mentioned how, you know, this was a, a production-style quality committee, and it wasn't very long. As you can see, I didn't talk for it for that long. One of the reasons for that is attention spans are short and it seems like this committee is uh, particularly aimed at presenting a record of evidence and demonstrating facts. And one of the things that is frustrating to me is these committees aren't cheap. These committees take up resources, uh, depositions, witness testimonies. Those are not cheap. Uh, this production that they hired, those things are not cheap. Those are things that we fund as taxpayers. And that's fine that you're gonna have a committee and we all wanna get to the bottom of what happened on January 6th so that it never happens again. How and the ever, what is gonna come out of this? What is gonna come out of this? You know, if all that comes out of this is information, then I feel like y'all should have made a movie and I know that sounds real cold, but but I, I do kind of mean that. If all that was going to come out of this is information, y'all could have made um, a, a three-part series, and each part could have been like an hour and forty-five minutes, and y'all could have made a y'all could have made a video. You could have did the same exact thing in video format and said, "Oh, we're going to release it each night on the you know house.gov website." Y'all know the house has their own website. Senate does too. Uh, Springport, all that. It's kind of cool. Um, and y'all could have released this. Y'all could have did something, or y'all could have, um, you know, contract. I, it's just. But anyway, it is good that we're getting to the bottom of this because it was a serious event, and um, the fact of the matter is, you had people marching on our Capitol some of these people carrying an enemy combatant's flag. And I don't care how you look at it, the Confederate flag represents a flag of a rebel army that lost to the Union. We live under the Union now. So yeah, that was the enemy combatant's flag as they marched and trampled, stormed, broke, beat, and everything else on our Capitol. It was 
extremely awful. Anyways, so starting on day two of the public hearing, this is the um, June 13th, Monday hearing. This started at 1030 um, Eastern time on June 13th, I believe. So this part of the hearing, as my understanding was supposed to focus on the big lie. And the big lie is the idea that something was um, deficient with the election, which Donald Trump lost. The idea being that if the election was deficient, then Donald Trump did not lose. However, the election was fine. The election was fine. The same stuff that went on in every election went on in this election. And I've said it, um, I've said it to friends a, a, a billion times. You know, I don't know what people think this is, but you are not going to get me to believe that there was a massive conspiracy amongst all 50 states, all these multiple states, and these election workers who dress like 1980s librarians, the men's and the women's, these election workers were all in up on it. No, that no. This election was just like every other election. Believe me, if it was if it was 50 rando Democrats who was cheating, it was 50 rando Republicans cheating across all 50 states. You just no. The, our elections don't work like that. We have state run elections for a reason. The states are very good at this. We pride ourselves in this. We pride ourselves in showing other countries how to do this. No, what no big you can't get two people in a marriage to agree to some. You telling me you got all these hundreds odd people to agree to the exact same scheme, the exact same way? I don't believe in it. And I won't. Anyways, moving forward. Benny Thompson uh, opens with day two again. He gives his opening remarks. Then the vice chair, uh, Liz Cheney, Republican from Wyoming, she goes on to talk. She said um, Trump told... Uh, multiple Trump was told by multiple people multiple times that you know he needed to wait for the vote count before he announced that he won he was told um don't tell he oh so let me rephrase this Donald Trump has started telling people not to vote by mail at the time of this election, the 2020 election, we were in the midst of COVID. So in addition to the regular vote by mail that happens, many states expanded their vote by mail program so that people wouldn't congregate. So that, you know, it was even more ex accessible to people so they wouldn't be out. And he was telling people don't vote by mail. Apparently people told him not to do that. This is where she makes the Rudy Giuliani was inebriated talking about he told him, um, oh, just say you won. And the machine this and the machine that. Foolishness. Um, I'm going to tell y'all about voting by mail. I've had personal conversations with people at, at the somewhere around the time of this who never voted by mail in their life. And I would like to give everybody a bit of advice. One, if it doesn't apply, let it fly. And two, if you don't know what you're talking about, temper down <laughs> some of that bass in your voice and some of that judgmental nature when you discuss something. Because these are people who never voted by mail saying, well, what if they just throw all the Republican votes away? First of all, when you vote by mail, you get an envelope and you do your voting in it and then you have to seal up the envelope. If somebody throws away all the votes, they wouldn't know if they're throwing away Republican votes, Democrat votes, independent votes, mixed up votes, people who wrote their name down the ballot or what. You, There's nothing outside of that. So then, well, they can't see your personal information. Duh. You have to mail this in. No, I wouldn't want all of my personal information on the outside of this envelope. It's on the inside of the envelope. Well, how do they know that it's yours? First of all, when they open it, they're going to see my information. Second off, there's usually a barcode on it. I voted by mail in one, 
two states now. Three, no, two, two states now. I voted by mail in two states now. Two different states. It was the same. They sent me the envelope, how it was supposed to work. You fold wherever you need to fold or you stuff wherever you need to stuff. I think it just has your name. It's pre, um, is it pre-postage? Yeah, I want to say it's even pre-postage for you. It has the little barcode on the back of it and you just need to do your thing. So, you know, but, but people who had never done this process didn't know about it and only had negative things to say about it. That's fine if you think negatively of it, but what is not fine if you don't know anything about it and you have a negative opinion, you don't know anything about it. Maybe learn a little bit. I'll get off that. So after the chairman and the vice chair speak, it's still day two morning. Um, Zoe Lofren, Democrat from California, she gives her opening remarks, but she, so at the first day of hearings, mainly Liz Cheney spoke. On this day, the Zoe Lofgren, I think it's Lofgren. She was the main guider, main uh, speaker this day, uh, Congresswoman from California, Democrat. So the primary witness for this um, first half of the the primary panelist or witness for this first half of the day two hearing was Chris Starwall. Chris Starwall is a I don't know what his official title is. I've watched him a lot on Fox News. I know he's good at polling um, and analyzing polls in not a numbers way, analyzing polls in not a quantitative way. He analyzes it qualitatively. He, I'm sure he can do both, but for me, the qualitative analysis is more accessible. He's from West Virginia. And since I've watched him, I've been watching him for a long time. He's very, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I'd say he's independent. I still think he's a conservative, but to me, he's very common sense in how he analyzes things. So what is his significance? Chris Starwall was um, and has been for a long time, had been part of the Fox News decision desk. This is the team that on election nights, they poll, they have polls that they've done and then they see where the numbers are coming in from and they can make the projection of where the state's going to go. This happens on every news station. This has happened in every election, even the ones I wasn't born in. This is how elections work. It is a, uh, I can't remember the exact verbiage. It is a myth. It is a cultural myth that election results are decided on the night. They're never really decided on election night. They are projected. And because of these decision teams of various news outlets and what have you, they can project the results pretty much to accuracy. I don't know any time that they're not counting Bush Gore. That was a lot of moving parts. But there's, these aren't overturned. This is just how it works. They project what the results are going to be. On election night, we never have all of like service men and women ballots in or you know we just we never we always still have some information that's coming in but for the most part no for all of the parts it's not information that's outcome determinative which is why we are able to project you know the results on election night election night results when you hear them on the news those are projections there's still information coming in and there will always be information coming in we have service men and women who vote from overseas we may not have all of their information in, whatever. That's why we don't swear in exactly that night. We wait a little bit <laughs> in the off chance that it is outcome determinant, but it, it, it's not. So he was part of the Fox News decision desk and they called Arizona first. They called Arizona for Joe Biden first. 
And they were right. Arizona went for Joe Biden. It hasn't been overturned, hasn't been rescinded. There's, they were right. Well, long story short, after that, Chris Stirewall ended up getting fired from Fox for X, Y, and Z reason. But this is just a personal story from that night. I was watching Fox News. Uh, I was watching Fox and maybe NBC on election night. But I was mainly watching to see what Fox was going to do. I always had watched Fox. So they called Arizona. And then the next segment guest came on. And I want to say it was Larry Kudlow, but I just cannot remember exactly who it was. But he proceeds to go all the way in on Brett Bear and um, um, Monica um, Martha McCallum, who were the election night people. Oh, he went all the way in. It is, you know, in, it is disrespectful. It is, um, it is embarrassing. You guys shouldn't have caught that. It's too early. It is irresponsible. Yada 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 yada. And Brett. And, Mon, um, and Martha were like, our decision team made the call and we are, you know, we are going to look in on that call and bring up our decision team. I had never seen where the person from the decision team had to come up and explain himself about that call. But that happened on election night. A lot, a lot of people remember little stuff like that, but I do. Anyway, so Chris Starwall discusses the Fox News Arizona debacle and they give some other test of uh, they show other video footage and testimony and Zoe Lofgren asks Chris Starwall to explain the red mirage and he explains it exactly how I'm going to explain it over the years Melon ballot, melon voting has become increasingly popular, but it has always been a little bit more popular with Democrats than it has been for Republicans. I guess I'm an outlier, but I personally, I like to be in my house, research people, pull up their names and pictures, you know, vote all nice and comfy in my house, put it in my little ballot, send it off. But anyways, so mail-in voting is just a little bit or has historically been a little bit more popular with Democrats in some areas than it has been Republicans. I think one statistic was mail-in voting in Florida was about equal, but that's the truth. So on election night, the in-person votes are always counted first. So typically you have a surge of a majority of Republican voters in person first, depending on where you are, depending on what state you're looking at, depending on what's going on, but that's the trend. As the mail-in ballots come in, you start to see it, you know, purple out, blue out or whatever. That is known as the red mirage. Chris Starwall said, and he didn't have to say, because I knew just as a common sense, rational person, he said it happens every election. He said, this is historically typical. This happens every election. He said, but because of the information that was being put out ahead of this election by the Trump team, he said Fox had made the decision at the time to educate voters on that phenomenon. But he said, this is not new. And it wasn't new just to the 2020 election. He said, this is this happens every time. He says that... Um, you know, basically the effort was to educate their voters on that that is colloquially known as the red mirage to anybody who does this. He said how they call results, how they make decisions to call the results for a state is they do their internal polls. Uh, so like Fox, CNN, NBC, whoever, they do their own internal polling and how it worked at Fox, and I'm assuming it probably works the same way everywhere else is. If they start to see that their internal polls are matching what the actual results are that are being reported in, then they get to a certain point. Um, 
I don't I don't know what that certain point is. Maybe, OK, this much of votes are counted and their polls look like our polls. We can call it, which is probably what happens, which is what they did for Arizona. He said that when they called Arizona, they had already went on to call Georgia and the other states they were looking at. And so all this controversy is happening. Martha and Brett are getting <laughs> called everything but a child of God by uh, XYZ Rando. And he said they didn't know that there was an issue. He said they had moved on to analyzing other states and he didn't understand. And then he repeated, we called Arizona and we called Arizona right. The results in Arizona have not been overturned. There's been no issue. Biden won, state of Arizona. Well, the issue is, I guess that push, there was... Um, a limited pathway to victory after Arizona was called, a limited pathway to victory for the Trump campaign after Arizona was called. And to that, I say, tough titty said to kitty, but the milk went bad. Grow up. That's what happens. Move on. So um, uh, I just don't understand. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Then there was all this issue about voting with machines and the problem and this and that. I just don't know. Uh, Zoe, sorry. Yes. Zoe Lofgren, she makes a statement that CISA, cyber security, it's cyber security, internet and something else agency. They rejected that there was any security breach or interference electronically, um, cyberly with the voting machines. Mind you, if I'm not mistaken, the CISA, this was a Trump created agency. An agency that I actually think was uh, right on time with the creation of, and they rejected that there was any funny business going on. We moved on. So they took a little bit break and then the second panel came and I'll keep it brief because um, they these all happen brief. The second panel was of a Georgia and a Pennsylvania like officials. Um, and then so a Georgia official and a Pennsylvania official, people who were um, in an official capacity involved in election management is the best way I can say it. And there was also someone who was considered the top litigating uh, election attorney. And this happens to also be the attorney who represented Bush, who represented George Bush in the Bush v. Gore fiasco. They didn't speak very much. It was a lot of video. And then they was dismissed. Um, Zoe Lofgren gave her closing remarks and then Liz Cheney gave her closing remarks. So, you know, I'm going to keep on it. There's going to be, it sounds like there's going to be seven of these is what it sounds like. I'm going to keep coming to you guys with these little recap and reviews. Um, we'll see how it goes. Again, I don't come to you guys just so that you don't, Wait, what's the phrase? I don't watch so that you don't have to. I watch so that you might get a little bit interested and then go watch as well. But that's what's going on. I'll be back for the next one. Stay informed, guys.